Good evening, friends, fiends, and night owl supremes. Welcome to A Bit Late, where we have finally had the first snow of the wintry season. Ooh. I, for one, really love the way everything gets so quiet when it snows. The sky lights up and it's really bright and you can see so far even when the moon isn't quite full. I love that. So to celebrate, I am, of course, wearing a ton of blankets, a big sweater. It's time. It's time for comfy. I mean, it's always time for comfy, but now it's really time for comfy. And we are, of course, reading Snow White or Snowdrop from the Brothers Grimm. It starts off in winter with snow, so, you know, we've got that in common right now. But with the weather getting chilly and cold, it's always nice to curl up with a familiar story, even if it has a bit of a grim twist. <laughs> but I do hope you're doing well and are also in the mood for a story that you may know quite well, in and out, through and through, grim details included. We did cover this on main channel, and it was a fun time, let me tell you, and you probably know, or have guessed. But without further ado, grab a cup of hot chocolate or tea, grab your coziest blankets, summon your most lap-friendly animal familiars, stare out the window, and if it's snowing, enjoy it, and if it's not, imagine it snowing in your mind's eye, and follow me into the Brothers Grimm's Snowdrop. It was the middle of winter when the broad flakes of snow were falling around that the queen of a country many thousand miles off sat working at her window. The frame of the window was made of fine black ebony, and as she sat looking out upon the snow, she pricked her finger, and three drops of blood fell upon it. As you're looking out your window, don't prick your finger. Then she gazed thoughtfully upon the red drops that sprinkled the white snow and said, would that my little daughter may be as white as that snow, as red as that blood, and as black as this ebony window frame. I must say, she's quite calm and collected for having just pricked herself. She's very introspective too, like not, ah, I pricked my finger, but, oh, I just know I'm pregnant maybe with a girl, or if I'm not, I hope I am. And I hope she looks like this mess of fluids right here. Cool. Or not mess, abstract art, we'll say. Anyway, and so the little girl really did grow up. Her skin was as white as snow, her cheeks as rosy as the blood, and her hair as black as ebony. And she was called Snowdrop. Ah, so she had already had the daughter she wasn't expecting. That makes sense. And that varies from tale to tale, but I'm glad we have clarity for this particular one. But this queen died, and the king soon married another wife, who became queen and was very beautiful but so vain that she could not bear to think that anyone could be handsomer than she was. She had a fairy looking glass to which she used to go and then she would gaze upon herself in it and say, Tell me glass, tell me true, of all the ladies in the land, who is fairest, tell me who? And the glass had always answered, Thou queen art fairest in all the land. But Snowdrop grew more and more beautiful, and when she was seven years old, she was as bright as the day and fairer than the queen herself. At seven years old? Oh, I don't know about compare. I mean, I'm sure she was really pretty and cute, but that's the same thing to the looking glass? I never really questioned that until right now. Or maybe I always have in the back of my mind, but now we're equating a seven-year-old with a queen. Ooh, anyway... Continuing in the creepy fairy tale, then the glass one day answered the queen when she went to look in it as usual. Thou queen art fair and beauteous to see, but Snowdrop is lovelier far than thee. Maybe they're talking about mannerisms and charm and the beauty of the heart? I mean, we know the queen has vanity issues, but anyway, when she heard this, she turned pale with rage, like Snowdrop pale? and envy, and called to one of her servants and said, Take Snowdrop away in the wide wood that I may never see her any more. Then the servant led her away, but his heart melted when Snowdrop begged him to spare her life, and he said, I will not hurt you, thou pretty child. I didn't realize she gave him orders to kill her so soon. Ah, but here we are. So he left her by herself, and though he thought it most likely that the wild beast would tear her in pieces, he felt as if a great weight were taken off his heart when he had made up his mind not to kill her, but to leave her to her fate, with the chance of someone finding and saving her. 
Then poor Snowdrop wandered along through the wood in great fear, and the wild beast roared about her, but none did her any harm. In the evening, she came to a cottage among the hills and went in to rest, for her little feet would carry her no further. Everything was spruce and neat in the cottage. On the table was spread a white cloth, and there were seven little places, seven little loaves, and seven little glasses with wine in them. Interesting, they leave the things prepared. Hmm, wouldn't dust get in? Sorry. And seven knives and forks laid in order, and by the wall stood seven little beds. As she was very hungry, she picked a little piece of each loaf and drank a very little wine out of each glass, and after she thought that she would lie down and rest. Maybe she was a little tipsy. That wasn't in the Disney one. What? So she tried all the little beds, but one was too long and another was too short. Is this Goldilocks? Till at last the seventh suited her, and there she laid herself down and went to sleep. I didn't realize she was shorter than some of the dwarves, but then she is seven years old, I suppose. Sevens all over. Wow, that's a common thing in fairy tales. By and by, in came the masters of the cottage. Now they were seven little dwarfs. Oh, sorry for spoiling that earlier. I thought we knew. That lived among the mountains and dug and searched for gold. They lighted up their seven lamps and saw at once that all was not right. The first said, Who has been sitting on my stool? The second, Who has been eating off my plate? The third, Who has been picking my bread? The fourth, Who has been meddling with my spoon? The fifth, who has been handling my fork? The sixth, who has been cutting with my knife? The seventh, who has been drinking my wine? Then the first looked round and said, Who has been lying in my bed? And the rest came running to him, and everyone cried out that somebody had been upon his bed. But the seventh saw Snowdrop and called all his brethren to come and see her. And they cried out with wonder and astonishment and brought their lamps to look at her and said, Good heavens, what a lovely child she is and they were very glad to see her and took care not to wake her. She needs that sleep. And the seventh dwarf slept an hour with each of the other dwarfs in turn, till the night was gone. Oh, what gentlemen they are. That's so sweet. Also, he didn't get a very good rest, did he? I don't, would that count as a full rest in D&D? &D? I don't know. Maybe it doesn't matter because there's nothing important to do the next day. Just, you know, hang out. Regardless, in the morning, Snowdrop told them all her story, and they pitied her, and said that if she would keep all things in order, and cook, and wash, and knit, and spin for them, she might stay where she was, and they would take good care of her. Even though she's taking care of them, it seems. They're bringing home the game, maybe. Then they went out all day long to their work, seeking for gold and silver in the mountains. But Snowdrop was left at home, and they warned her and said, the queen will soon find out where you are, so take care and let no one in. But the queen, now that she thought Snowdrop was dead, believed that she must be the handsomest lady in the land. So why not just assume and take that as you will? Why do you have to check? Ugh. She went to her glass and said, Tell me, glass, tell me true. Of all the ladies in the land, who is fairest? Tell me who. And the glass answered, Thou queen art fairest in all this land, but over the hills in the greenwood shade, where the seven dwarves their dwelling have made, where Snowdrop is hiding her head, and she is lovelier far, O queen, than thee. The queen was very much frightened. Really? Frightened, really? Angry, maybe? For she knew that the glass always spoke the truth and was sure that the servant had betrayed her and she could not bear to think that anyone lived who was more beautiful than she. So she dressed herself up as an old peddler. Because if you're worried about your looks, you dress yourself up as an old peddler. Sure. Ah. <sighs> and went her way over the hills to the place where the dwarves dwelt. Then she knocked at the door and cried, Fine wares to sell. Snowdrop looked out the window and said, Good day, old woman. What have you to sell? Fine wares, fine wares, she said. Lace and bobbins of all colors. I will let the old lady in. She seems to be a very good sort of body, thought Snowdrop, with her worldly experience, as she ran down and unbolted the door. Bless me, said the old woman. How badly your stays are laced. Let me lace them up with one of my new laces. Snowdrop did not dream of any mischief, so she stood before the old woman, not thinking about how she would pay the old woman for her laces. Eh, maybe there's stuff at home. 
I'm overthinking this, as we do on this channel. Hey. But the old woman set to work so nimbly and pulled the lace so tight that Snowdrop's breath was stopped, and she fell down as if she were dead. There's an end to all thy beauty, said the spiteful queen and went away home. Should check your work, lady. In the evening, the seven dwarves came home, and I need not say how grieved they were to see their faithful Snowdrop stretched out upon the ground as if she were quite dead. However, they lifted her, and when they found what ailed her, they cut the lace. And in a little time, she began to breathe, and very soon came to life again. Then they said, The old woman was the queen herself. Take care another time and let no one in when we are away. How long was Snow White not breathing, though? How does that work? How does that work? Regardless, a few hours maybe later, when the queen got home, she went straight to her glass and spoke to it as before. But to her great grief, it still said, Thou queen art fairest in all this land, but over the hills in the greenwood shade, where their seven dwarves their dwelling have made, their snowdrop was hiding her head, and she is lovelier far, O queen, than thee. Then the blood ran cold in her heart with spite and malice to see that Snowdrop still lived. See, check your work. Not condoning what she's doing or condoning these actions at all, but check your work. Hmm? Stay? Make sure it's done? I don't know, I'm sorry. And she dressed herself up again, but in quite another dress from the one she wore before and took with her a poisoned comb. Ah, it's poisoned. When she reached the dwarf's cottage, she knocked at the door and cried, Fine wares to sell! But Snowdrop said, I dare not let anyone in. Then the queen said, Only look at my beautiful combs, and gave her the poisoned one. And it looked so pretty that she took it up and put it into her hair to try it. But the moment it touched her head, the poison was so powerful that she fell down senseless. And it didn't do that on her hands though? I wonder... Anyway, combs are in an earlier tale, as we discuss on main channel, a Basile tale. Anyway, Snow White has fell down senseless after the comb has touched her scalp, because it's poisoned, but not poisoned for her fingers, maybe calluses. There you may lie, said the queen, and went her way, not checking her work. But by good luck, the dwarves came in very early that evening, and when they saw Snowdrop lying on the ground, they thought what had happened and soon found the poisoned comb. And when they took it away, she got well and told them all that had passed, and they warned her once more not to open the door to anyone. Come on, Snow White, come on. We ask you one thing. Well, a lot of things could clean all the stuff, but for your own safety, don't open the door. She's too trusting, and she is seven years old in this story. Meantime, the queen went home to her glass and shook with rage when she read the very same answer as before. And she said, Snowdrop shall die if it cost me my life. So she went by herself into her chamber and got ready a poisoned apple. Poison didn't work from the outside, maybe it will from the inside. The outside looked very rosy and tempting, but whoever tasted it was sure to die. Then she dressed herself up as a peasant's wife and traveled over the hills to the dwarf's cottage and knocked at the door. But Snowdrop put her head out of the window and said, I dare not let anyone in, for the dwarves have told me not. But she didn't let her in last time. Do as you please, said the old woman. But at any rate, take this pretty apple. I will give it to you. No, said Snowdrop. I dare not take it. You silly girl, answered the older. What are you afraid of? Do you think it's poisoned? Come, do you eat one part and I will eat the other. Now, the apple was so made up that one side was good, though the other side was poisoned. Then, Snowdrop was much tempted to taste, for the apple looked so very nice, and when she saw the old woman eat, she could wait no longer. But she had scarcely put the piece into her mouth when she fell down dead upon the ground. This time, nothing will save thee, said the queen, and she went home to her glass, and at last it said, Thou queen art fairest of all the fair. And then her wicked heart was glad and as happy as such a heart could be. So, Snow White is dead now. It says that. It says she's dead. It said she was poisoned. And it's poison. It's not like a spell. And this is where I always get confused and slightly irked. I mean, I'm happy things end a different way for some people. But 
When evening came and the dwarves had gone home, they found Snowdrop lying on the ground. No breath came from her lips, and they were afraid that she was quite dead. Well, that's what the narrator said. They lifted her up and combed her hair with not the poisoned comb and washed her face with wine and water, but it was all in vain, for the little girl seemed quite dead. Ah, now she seems quite dead. So they laid her down, and all seven watched and bewailed her three whole days, which is as long as they've known her, and then they thought they would bury her, but her cheeks were still very rosy, and her face looked just as it did when she was alive, so they said, We will never bury her in the cold ground. And they made a coffin of glass so that they might still look at her, because that's not weird, and wrote upon it in golden letters what her name was and that she was a king's daughter. Did a whole video on this concept too. Only the best, you know? Sorry. It's all creepy. Oh, fairy tales. And the coffin was set among the hills, and one of the dwarves always sat by it and watched. And the birds of the air came too and bemoaned Snowdrop. Oh, that's kind. And first of all came an owl, then a raven, and at last a dove, and sat by her side. Straight up Disney birds now, but this is a sad time. And thus Snowdrop lay for a long, long time, and still only looked as though she were asleep. For she came even now as white as snow, and as red as blood, and as black as ebony. At last a prince came and called at the dwarf's house, and he saw Snowdrop and read what was written in the golden letters. Then he offered the dwarfs money and prayed and besought them to let him take her away, but they said, We will not part with her for all the gold in the world. And she's seven years old, remember. Yikes. At last, however, they had pity on him, or he was a king's son and they had no power over him, and gave him the coffin. But the moment he lifted it up to carry it home with him, the piece of apple fell from between her lips. And it didn't when the dwarves were combing her hair and setting her up and washing her face with wine and water. <sighs> and Snowdrop awoke and said, Where am I? And the prince said, Thou art quite safe with me. Hmm. Then he told her all that had happened and said, I love you far better than all the world, so come with me to my father's palace and you shall be my wife. You seven-year-old child, oh my god. This one's bad. In some versions of the tale, the father, the king, finds his daughter and is like, oh my gosh, my daughter. And it's a happily ever after and she gets married when she's older, but that's not the case in this tale that we found to read tonight on this snowy winter's evening. Hmm. Anyway, the prince who we don't know how old he is, doesn't matter really, asked the seven-year-old Snowdrop to be his wife, and Snowdrop consented and went home with the prince, and everything was got ready with pomp and splendor for their wedding. To the feast was asked, among the rest, Snowdrop's old enemy, the queen, and as she was dressing herself in fine rich clothes, she looked in the glass and said, Tell me, glass, tell me, Drew, of all the ladies in the land, who is fairest, tell me who? And the glass answered, Thou lady art loveliest here, I ween, but lovelier far is the new maid queen. When she heard this, she started with rage, but her envy and curiosity were so great that she could not help setting out to see the bride. Who, if it weren't Snow White, her mere wouldn't have even heard of until now, that makes no sense, it has to be Snow White. And when she got there and saw that it was no other than Snowdrop, who, as she thought, had been dead a long while, she choked with rage and fell down and died. What? But Snowdrop and the prince lived and reigned happily over the land many, many years. And sometimes they went up into the mountains and paid a visit to the little dwarfs who had been so kind to Snowdrop in her time of need. The End I must say, there are many versions of Snow White, and this one is interesting, as expected. In some versions, the queen is given red-hot iron shoes and is forced to put them on and dance until she drops down dead, her feet burning and blistering all the while. Fun times were had at this wedding. Torture of the stepmother. Fun. Not fun. For anyone. But, you know, maybe if Snow White was dead for, I mean, air quotes, dead for so long, maybe she aged in the coffin and grew, like our little friend in Jan Battista Basile's tale. Also a fun tale. Air quotes fun. Maybe she aged and she's like 50. 
when the prince sees her in the coffin. She's a regal age for a queen. I don't know, she's probably not 50, but 16, 18. We'll go with that. Not that I'm trying to retroactively justify fairy tales, but wow, sometimes I tell you, well, you know, we read tons of fairy tales here. You know what these are like. But I do hope that you enjoyed the story. Thank you for hanging out with me. It's been a very real pleasure enjoying the first snowfall with you. I hope you have a wonderful evening or day and that you're getting along great with whatever you're doing or you're sleeping if that's what you need. Now off to sleep and dream what you will or stay a while and enjoy another tale. Whichever you choose, I'll speak to you again. And until then, stay spooky, my friends. Good night.